Okay. Uh, menti.com. Uh, the code is 7530974. And uh, you just need to go to menti.com and put your questions there. And then you submit. There's a question uh, for you to submit. How to uh, submit your question for Hajan Brown. So you type in your question, press submit, and you will go, and it will go to the uh, um, mentee for tonight. So Ajahn Brahmali, a uh, short bio for Ajahn Brahmali. Ajahn Brahmali was born in Norway in 1964. He first became interested in Buddhism and meditation in his early 20s and began his monastic training as an Anagarika in England at Amaravati and Chithas Buddhist Monastery. After hearing teachings from Ajahn Brahm, he decided to travel to Australia to train at Bodhiyana Monastery. Ajahn Brahmali has lived in Bodhiyana Monastery since 1994 and ordained as a bhikkhu with Ajahn Brahm as his preceptor in 1996. Ajahn Brahmali's knowledge of the Pali language and of the suttas is excellent. Bhikkhu Bodhi, who translated most of the Pali canon into English for wisdom publications, called him one of his major helpers for the recent tra translation of the numerical discourse of the Buddha. He has also published two essays on dependent origination and a book called The uh, Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Texts in collaboration with Bhante Sujato. Ajahn has been instrumental in most of the building and maintenance projects at Bodhiyana. <laughs> the screen disappeared, sorry Ajahn. <laughs> <laughs> maintenance projects at Bodhiyana Monastery. Ajahn Brahmali's clear and thoughtful talks make the teachings of the Buddha easily accessible to all. He has given talks in many countries, including Singapore, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. Thank you, Ajahn, for uh, giving us all the sutta, um, our upcoming sutta lessons. We look forward to it. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Yes, Ajahn. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I just start. Sorry. Okay. Please. Uh, we, uh, yeah. Like uh, Velpa Sunyo mentioned, the recent retreat, I would like to challenge you to remove our ignorance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, you know what it's like. You have to remove the hindrance yourself, you know? So you have to kind of take this, take the information on board, and you have to do all the hard work yourself. Unfortunately, I have to apologize. That's the way it works in Buddhism. You can't really do it for anyone else. So anyway, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Nice to be with you all again. And uh, it's marvelous that we can come together, even though we are kind of secluded and we are forced to stay in our home countries in this way. It's still great that we can meet in this particular way. The Dhamma doesn't, there's no boundaries anymore with the Dhamma, which is marvelous because that is sort of exactly what the Buddha was saying. The Dhamma kind of rolls on regardless of cultures or distances or times or whatever it is and that's the way it should be so it's great to want marvelous to be able to be with you in this particular way so i'm going to as usual look at the suttas yeah ajahn brahm he gives the general talks i do the suttas and nothing has changed that's the way it has been for a long time and maybe it will continue to be we will see what happens and uh, the i sent out some suttas for everyone. Hopefully you have got those suttas. And uh, if you haven't got them, it doesn't matter. You can just sit back and relax and enjoy. And if you don't enjoy, then uh, that's okay too. You don't have to, I'm not gonna force you to enjoy. So whatever, whatever works, whatever happens is okay. So you may wonder when you look at, if you've had a look at that uh, collection of suttas that I sent out, you may wonder what is the, system what are these suttas how do they connect together yeah it seems a bit strange when maybe you look at that collection that i have given out but um, if you look carefully and if you know uh, your suttas well and you know how the buddha normally teaches the dhamma you will notice that they actually and it may be surprising to be to, to uh, 
to, to next time around. Uh, and the structure of the suttas that are part of this handout is actually the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah, and uh, it may not be obvious because it starts off with the Kalama Sutta and then it goes off to the various verses and all kinds of things. But actually the structure behind it is the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, so that, that is uh, the idea behind this, yeah? And uh, the reason I have chosen so many unusual suttas is because I like to do things a little bit differently. Because when you do things differently, it gets a bit more fresh, it gets a bit more interesting perhaps for people. Very often I do the same suttas, but I thought, let's do something else this time, just to bring in some different angles on the Dhamma. It's very important to see things from different angles sometimes. And the Buddha is a master of that. Yeah, you can read the suttas of the Buddha, the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses, the middle discourses, the connected discourses, and the numerical discourses. You can read that and you can see that he says pretty much the same things again and again and again. Yeah, it's very repetitive. And sometimes you start yawning and sometimes you may fall asleep because it's so repetitive. But if you look carefully, you will notice that actually it is not really exactly the same every time. Very often it is a variation on the theme. Yeah, it's the same theme that the Buddha brings out. But then there are small variations within that theme. And this is what makes the sutta so interesting. Because if you gather together all those various, if you understand the suttas from the different angles, it actually brings out the richness in these teachings. And you start to understand the path in a much deeper and profound way. And that is what this is about. So if the suttas seem strange, hopefully by the end of this course, by the end of the six days, you will have more appreciation for what is going on here. That is the plan anyway, the reality, we don't know, but that's the kind of plan, that's the idea. And if it doesn't work out, it's probably the teacher's fault. So then you can complain, it's not gonna make any difference because I'm still gonna teach in the same, same way. But uh, you know, we know what it's like. I just do my best and I will see what, see what happens. So uh, just uh, very briefly before I get into this particular suttas, uh, I just wanted to say something about the importance of having some understanding of the teachings of the Buddha, yeah, why this actually matters. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the reasons why it matters so enormously uh, is that these suttas that we're going to look at now, uh, these suttas are known sometimes as the four Nikayas, uh, yeah, the four collections, if you like. Uh, sometimes they are known as the early Buddhist texts. Uh, and if you look at the history of Buddhism, uh, and you look at how Buddhism has developed over a long period of time into the different schools and into the different commentaries and all the various things, uh, you find out quite quickly that these particular texts that we're going to look at now, these are the texts that all schools of Buddhism have in common here. This is something very, very important fact about the Buddhist teachings, uh, because it means that all teachings apart from these ones are built on these teachings. Everything that came later, whether it is the Mahayana suttas, which came much later than these suttas, whether it is the commentaries like the very famous Visuddhimagga, Whatever in Buddhism, all the various forms of Buddhism have one thing in common, and it is these particular suttas. And the rest of Buddhism, yeah, all the Buddhism that's happened over the last two and a half thousand years, it only makes sense in light of these suttas. These suttas are the foundation on which everything else is built. And without these suttas, nothing else makes sense. And now you can see why it matters so much, yeah? Because this is the foundation stone of everything that we have in Buddhism. Without this, there is nothing here. So for that reason, I think that anyone who is interested in the Buddhist teachings, uh, and it doesn't matter if you consider yourself a, a Theravada Buddhist, whether you consider yourself an early uh, Buddhist, whether you consider yourself a disciple of the Buddha, whether you are a disciple of Ajahn Brahm, whether you are a disciple of whoever, uh, yeah? If you are a Buddhist, these teachings should be of fundamental importance. Why? Because it is the one thing that we all have in common as Buddhists. It's the one thing that we all can agree on. This was taught by the Buddha. 
And just as a small thing, which I think is very important to realize that even if you are a Mahayana Buddhist, even then you should consider these things important. And uh, you may have heard of as a very famous uh, Taiwanese uh, Buddhist master, Master Yin Shen, which probably many, many of you have heard about because he is very, very famous in Taiwan. Uh, he was born in mainland China and then he fled to Taiwan when you know the whole when you had the civil war in China and all of that. Uh, and he uh, became, he probably is the most famous uh, yeah, of all the uh, Taiwanese, Chinese uh, masters of Buddhism. And he also said that these suttas, uh, yeah, these uh, agamas or these nikayas, uh, they are the foundation of everything in Buddhism. These are the real teachings of the Buddha and everything else is built on top of that. Uh, so both Mahayana schools and Theravada agree that this is the foundation of Buddhism. So this is where we should come back. This is the gold standard for what Buddhism really is about. This is, if you want to know if anyone is telling the truth, if you want to know if anyone's teaching is correct according to how the Buddha taught, this is where you have to go. This is where you have to compare everything with. Yeah? So this is very exciting because once you know these teachings, then you can go around and you can criticize everyone in the world. There you can say, you are telling the truth, you are not telling the truth. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't recommend that, but uh, it gives you a basis for uh, deciding yeah, and for understanding what are the true teachings and what are not the true teachings. So it matters, uh, I would say, a lot. And that is why I definitely find these teachings very interesting here. Yeah. So uh, now let us come back to these uh, teachings uh, and especially the things that I have uh, have on this particular uh, little booklet there, a little uh, staple together or whatever it is, however, whatever form you have it in, probably electronically PDF or whatever, and see what it is all about. Uh, uh, the very first of these suttas is called the uh, Kalama Sutta, yeah, very famous sutta. It's actually called the uh, uh, it's actually called something else, I think, yeah. But uh, Kalama Sutta is what it is often known as. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm going to talk about this particular sutta is because it provides a very nice foundation for how to think about the Buddha's teachings, yeah? what they are, how to reflect on them, how to use them in the right way. Yeah? And this, in turn, is a very basic part of the idea of right view. Right, yeah? right view, I said, is the is again is the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path. So these teachings are going to be about the Noble Eightfold Path. And for this reason, we're going to start with right view. And the Kalama Sutta is really part of this idea of right view. So why, first of all, why does right view matter so much? What is it about right view that really is so important? Well, first of all, it matters enormously because it is the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah, it is at the starting point. And what that means is that without that right view, there isn't really any noble eightfold path. You don't really get started. You don't even get to take the first steps on the path unless you have a little bit of that right view. So you need that foundation stone or right view for the path even to begin. Yeah. So this is why it matters so enormously. And the stronger that right view more powerful your practice of the Noble Eightfold Path is going to be. Yeah, it depends on that right view. So if you can strengthen the right view, if you can make that more clear, thinking about the world in the right way, aligning the way you think about the world with the way the Buddha thinks about the world, if you can do that, the more you can do that, the more powerful this path is going to be. And what that means is that all the other factors of the path will come into existence, will arise as a consequence of that right view being strong. Yeah? So the right intention comes from that. Uh, the morality comes from that. Uh, the effort and then the mindfulness. Yeah, the mindfulness also arises from this whole con conglomeration of uh, prior factors of the path, starting with right view. And even uh, uh, stillness, even the samadhi at the very end also depends on that right view at the beginning here. All of these things come together here. And very often the way that we talk about right view, we talk about right view of, you know, there is rebirth, there is karma and these kind of things. And of course, 
that matters. Yeah, that is an important part of it. Is, this is not insignificant at all. And it's a very dangerous thing when some people in the modern world want to kind of eliminate the idea of rebirth from Buddhism. If you do that, you are neutering the Buddhist path and you are, it's no longer Buddhism really. Why? Because the right view at the very beginning of the path has been shut off. But uh, the problem with things like rebirth yeah, and kamma and these things is that they are a little bit theoretical perhaps. They're not thin and relate to very easily. Yeah? If, I, if we say that there is a rebirth, you say, okay, maybe there is rebirth, I kind of accept that. But it's difficult to really feel that there is a rebirth in a deep way here. Yeah? yeah, you kind of accept it, but it's not something that really becomes very personal to you very often. So I prefer, therefore, to look at right view from a more practical angle. How can we see right view in a practical way? And to do that, one of the uh, important things is to remember that if you think about right view in the right, right way, uh, not does it kind of make your ideas about rebirth and things right, uh, but it supports everything like virtue, and it also supports meditation practice. Uh, so it actually supports all the factors of the path in a very powerful way. Uh, and to do that, all you need to do is to think about the world in a certain way, think about the world in the way the Buddha thought about the world, yeah, which includes having a different kind of set of values, uh, valuing things differently, uh, knowing that there are certain things in life that are really valuable, that really matters, uh, and other things in life that you can actually put by the wayside that don't matter so much. Uh, so your whole value system starts to change, yeah? You think about things in an entirely new way. You start to accumulate new things. You value the inner life. You value kindness and generosity and all of these things. Why? Because of that right view. So I'm gonna give you a, a important example of what I mean by this. So, uh, we, uh, we finished our uh, rains retreat here at Bodhinyana Monastery about what is it, two and a half or something like that, yeah? And uh, during that Rainsor retreat, I uh, usually do some teachings, yeah, from the suttas, of course. What else? Everything I do is from the suttas. So we, I did some uh, sutta teachings. And uh, one of the questions that was asked, we talked about, was the question of how to meditate, obviously. Yeah, meditation is a very important part of the Rains Retreat. And hopefully you will be able to do some meditation as well during this retreat now. So one of the questions was, how do we apply Ajahn Brahm's teaching here on meditation? Yeah, that's a kind of critical question. Yeah, very important question. Ajahn Brahm, to my mind, is one of the great masters in the world of meditation practice. I have lived with Ajahn Brahm for uh, 26 years, uh, 27, whatever it is, 26 and a half years, something like that. Uh, and I have watched him in uh, situations, dealing with people, uh, and I've seen him in so many different ways. And I, to me, I have little doubt that of the great meditation masters in the world, he is one of those. Uh, and there are very few, actually, people who really are great meditation masters. Uh, so because of that, his teachings on meditation become very interesting. Yeah? How does he say that we should engage with the word of Buddha? When we talk about mindfulness of breathing, is Ajahn Brahm's uh, method for doing this? Yeah? And how, how does he teach? And those of you who have been around Ajahn Brahm, yeah, you will know that the way he teaches meditation is very often, yeah, you sit down, you just relax, yeah, really relax, don't do anything, just let go, just allow things to be, yeah, and you just really, really relax, you don't kind of relax a little bit, but as he likes to say, you relax to the max, yeah, this is one of Ajahn Brahm's sayings, so you relax to the max, and then when you relax to the max, what happens? Meditation just happens. That's what he says, yeah, but you relax to the max and then bang, you get peaceful. You get these nimittas, exploding lights and you go into the jhanas and you just have the most blissful states of your life as a consequence. So is that what happens to you, to every one of you? Is that what happens that every, when you sit down and you relax, you just enjoy the bliss every time? Or is it not like that? And a lot of people will say, 
I don't understand Ajahn Brahm's teaching. I sit down, I really relax, and what happens? I fall asleep, yeah, it's a very common one, or my mind is really, really restless. I'm just thinking about things all the time. I'm thinking about, oh, what shall I eat afterwards? Should I, you know, what, should I, what am I going to do this evening? Or oh, I have these problems at work. How can I resolve that? I have this argument with somebody. What can I do with that? And on and on it goes. Because I'll end to the problems and things of the world, yeah? So this is a fascinating. Why is it that for so many people, even though Ajahn Brahm's meditation method is the most simple meditation method you can imagine, uh, sit back, relax, and for him it works. Yeah, he obviously gets the results. Why is it that so many people find it difficult? Uh, why is it that we fall asleep or we think or nothing really happens or, or whatever? Uh, what is the reason for that? Uh, and that is a very interesting question, right? If we can answer that question, if we can understand the difference between ourselves and Ajahn Brahm, why, I'm just assuming now that you haven't got that kind of meditation. If you do, I apologize, but I'm assuming that you don't just close your eyes and you bang and you bliss out straight away. Yeah, it's just for most people, it is not like that. So what is the reason for this? And if we can answer this and we will know what it is that we have to do to move in that direction. So what do you think the answer is? Why is it that Ajahn Brahm does it this way and many people cannot do it in the same way? And you might say, maybe you might say, oh, it's because Ajahn Brahm meditates a lot. Yeah, he spends a lot of time on the top uh, of his time on his bottom and just meditating or maybe lying down or on his walking path or whatever. So maybe that is why he's so good. Yeah, I mean, he has all this training in meditation. And uh, that is maybe a little bit of it, but really only a tiny, tiny bit. Yeah, because uh, meditation is such an easy thing. It's such a simple thing. All you have to do is sit down and watch your breath or do nothing and then things happen. So it cannot be the entire story because it's so simple. It should happen quite naturally. It doesn't take a lot of training or a lot of watching the breath or how should I watch the breath and what should I be doing? It doesn't really take that because the thing is so simple in itself. And if you remember the Buddha or the Buddha to be before his awakening, yeah, you remember he was practicing and as a child, he was practicing, he was sitting under the rose apple tree. Uh, his father was doing some kind of work in the field somewhere, and he was just relaxing. And spontaneously, he went into a jhana state, yeah? So obviously, if you are ready for it, it will happen automatically. It is not something that you need to train a lot to be able to do. So what is it? If, if it is not the amount of training, then what is the reason why uh, it is not the same for someone like Al Brahm, yeah, compared to most other people. What is the reason? Huh? And uh, I will give you the short answer. Huh? Yeah, and the short answer is right view. Huh? Right view is the difference that uh, actually comes in between us uh, and our ability to meditate. Huh? Yeah, so if you are able, and this is why I'm going to focus a lot on right view now, if you are able to move your mind closer to the right view, to thinking about the world in the right way, the result of that will be it's going to improve dramatically. Not just your meditation, the entire noble path, but these things, these things come together, but your entire meditation experience will improve as a consequence. There's one problem with this, yeah, a very important problem, and that is that right to view is not something you can just take on board. Yeah, you can say, oh yeah, you know, I believe in this, or I have this view, and suddenly everything changes. It doesn't really work like that. Right view is something that you develop gradually over time. It is a particular way of thinking about life and thinking about the world. Is a particular way of appreciating what is of value in the world, yeah? of having the right priorities in your life. And this changing of your values and changing of your priorities is something that happens gradually here. And this is why it is important to be brainwashed. Yeah? <laughs> 
I use that term cheekily. It was Ajahn Brahm who originally used, used it, uh, you know, when I was a young monk in this monastery. And, but it is an important point. The idea is that we are conditioned to think about things in a certain way. And that conditioning, you can it very cheekily call it brainwashing, but it's really just conditioning. Everything is conditioning anyway. You've got to have some kind of conditioning, yeah? So you make sure you get the good conditioning rather than the bad one. And as you develop in this way, as you focus on the suttas, as you learn to reflect and think in the way the Buddha was thinking and reflecting, gradually your mind changes. Gradually you start to value new things in the world. And the things that you start to value, no surprise, will be things like kindness, like compassion, like peace. But also it means that you will move away from too much attachment to the things in the ordinary world. You will start to understand the limitations of the ordinary world. And when you understand those limitations, you move and you start to value entirely new things. That is the secret. That is why Ajahn Brahm is able to meditate properly. And most of the people don't have the same ability in meditation practice. So in brief, what it means is that Someone like Ajahn Brahm, he values peace. Yeah? He values the stillness of the mind you can have in meditation. Yeah? He values uh, relinquishing the things of the world, he's interested in the things of the world. This is part of right view. Yeah? Yeah? And because he values all of these things, uh, when he sits down and he meditates, yeah, he doesn't need anything. And the mind automatically, by its nature, because of that right view, goes towards peace goes towards relinquishment, goes towards giving things up, and goes towards the bliss of the mind inside, because he knows where real happiness is to be found. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, uh, you can maybe ask um, whether I'm telling, whether, whether I'm saying anything useful, or whether I'm just talking nonsense. Yeah? You can you test it, have a chance to uh, to def defend myself because I don't have any Q&A. The Q&A is just with Ajahn Brahm. So uh, uh, because of that, it is, you can kind of really, you know, you can really go for it and really complain about me when you ask Ajahn Brahm questions. Nothing I can say. So this is your, your chance if you want to do that. Uh, but please do so because what I say should be in accordance roughly with what Ajahn Brahm says. And if it is not, then of course, uh, uh, you know where to go for the real answers. Uh, so this is what this is about. And this is why I want to focus on right view uh, so much. As it is such a very significant part of the Buddhist teachings. And I guarantee you that if you do this in the right way and you start to reevaluate things, start to redirect your mind towards those things that actually are of real, true, lasting value in your life, uh, you're guaranteed it will have an effect, but you have to carry on for quite a while to see the gradual change. So with that in mind, I'm going to finally going to move on to the sutta for today. And uh, it is the uh, Kalama Sutta, a very quite a well-known sutta in the modern times because it kind of chimes a little bit with how we uh, think about the world. I think a lot of people like to think about the world, the idea of uh, Free thinking, yeah, a lot many people call themselves free thinkers, free thinkers these days. Of course, it is just a conceit. Nobody is a free, free thinker. We are all bound thinkers. We are bound by our conditioning. So free thinking is just another conceit. But anyway, it's a nice way of thinking. Yeah, it's a nice way of kind of approaching things. We try to be more open. Yeah, and that is, I think, is always a good idea, even if we are Buddhist, to be open-minded and to look at the world in a you know open way. And this is what this is about. So um, before I do that, I'm going to have a small uh, sip of coffee. Mm, okay. I hope you are not jealous, because if, if you are jealous, then uh, it gets problematic. But I have a bit of coffee just to kind of keep me going a little bit. I hope you forgive me for that. Uh, so this. Uh, sutta, the Kalama Sutta, is found in the uh, numerical discourses of the Buddha, uh, the threes, number 65, and this is one of, as uh, Ai Ling mentioned before, this is uh, these suttas, I actually worked quite closely with 
Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi in translation exercise. And that was a, a good fun. By the way, I'm saying that that uh, bio of me in the beginning is really dated. It's about maybe 10 or 15 years older. So maybe we should upgrade that bio a little bit because uh, uh, I think some of those tr things in there are no longer true. They might have been true 10 years ago, but things have changed a little bit. Yeah, My hair is much more gray. Yeah, Don't write that in the bio, but uh, you know. <laughs> so the things like that have, uh, have changed. Maybe we should kind of we can talk about that later on, Eiling, if we can upgrade the bio a little bit. Uh, but uh, let's focus on the sutta. So this is how it begins. And this translation is done by uh, Ajahn Sujato or Bhante Sujato, who many of you may know. He is a, uh, one of these uh, uh, super duper uh, people who translates all the, all, all the Nikayas and all this kind of amazing stuff. And if you want to see some of the things that he has done, uh, you can go to a website called suttacentral.net. And uh, there you find all the translations. Uh, and this is becoming now very slowly, I think it may be already, the world's number one website for the suttas. That is how important it has become. So it is a very, it's a very good job that he has been doing there. So um, let us get into this particular sutta. Uh, this is how it goes. Uh, so I have heard, you can hear this is a slightly different translation, it's the Ajahn Sujato translation. So I have heard, uh, at one time the Buddha was wandering in the land of the Kosalans uh, together with a large Sangha of uh, mendicants, yeah, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Uh, when he arrived at the town of the Kalamas named Kesa Mutta, so this was uh, the way the Buddha used to live, especially at the very beginning when he started out. He would wander around India, he would go from town to town, and he would meet the ordinary Indian people of the day. Yeah? This was a standard way that the ascetics and the Brahmins actually lived at that time. And it was like he was spreading his message, yeah? this beautiful message of the Dhamma that he had recently awakened to, and now he was delivering it to the people around the India Indian countryside. Later on, uh, the Buddha settled down more uh, and he became more stable, especially living in Savati, uh, the great capital of the same kingdom, the Korsalan kingdom. Uh, but in the early days, he seemed to have done a lot of wandering. Uh, and one of the peoples that he wandered to was the Kalama people in the city or the town of Kesa Mutta. The Kalamas of Kesa Mutta heard uh, it seems the ascetic Gautama, the Sakyan, gone forth from the Sakyan family, lived at Kesa Mutta. He has a good reputation that that blessed one is perfected, the awakened Buddha. Yeah, and then and then he has all kinds of about uh, perfect in knowledge and conduct and all of that kind of stuff. And then it ends up by saying it is good to see such perfected ones. Yeah, uh, so that is a very famous passage right there. And I have elided it. I have cut out a large part of it, just added a three dots there. The three dots signifying that it is a much larger passage. And uh, that passage which has been elided there is a very famous passage that you may know, though especially those of you who have been, been around the Buddhism for a long time. Uh, this is the Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddho Vidja Charana Sampano Sugato Loka Vidu, etc. passage. Yeah, very famous passage which uh, uh, elucidates, if you like, or brings out the qualities of the Buddha. And uh, I often talk about this passage in quite, quite at length during retreats because it is a very beautiful passage uh, and it gives you better access to the Buddha when you understand what this passage is about. Uh, it is the way the Buddha himself says that we should think about the Buddha. Yeah? So if we want to think about the Buddha in the right way, this is how the Buddha himself recommends we should think about the Buddha. So for that reason, it is a very powerful passage and very useful to um, reflect on. So I would, really, uh, I would really encourage you to reflect on these kind of passages. And then maybe when you go to a temple somewhere or you do this kind of chanting, the Itipi sword chanting, uh, you understand what it means. It starts to take on a very different life when you start to understand what it is about. Suddenly you get inspired in a much deeper way. Uh, these are real teachings. Yeah. 
had this really profound and beautiful teachings. And when you take them to heart, when you take them on board, and you can feel what this is about, the qualities of the Buddha, and think, wow, I have this person as my teacher. It's unbelievable. This is like the greatest spiritual genius in human history. Yeah, I should say in known human history. There may be a prehistory, maybe different eons or whatever. That's kind of irrelevant. Yeah, in the recorded human history, the Buddha is the greatest spiritual genius. What an amazing thing. What a wonderful thing it is. And how lucky I am to have a teacher like this. And you start to feel this uplift inside that we have this amazing possibility here that we have been given these teachings by someone who is so special here so this is the right way to think and if you think like that if you get emotional about it if you can feel a degree of joy about these teachings then they become incredibly powerful and then really on the fast track to gaining access and getting in to your meditation practice properly here so I would really recommend you to look at that. But uh, that is for another time. Otherwise, we're going to be here for a long, long time. Six days is not really long enough. You are aware of that, right? I hope you're aware of that. Six days is too short. Yeah, maybe more like 12 days. And, uh, and maybe sometimes you have to do both morning and evening for a long time for it to work out. I remember when I was in EF, uh, hello, Bobby, are you there, Bobby? I'm not sure if you are there somewhere. Probably some of you BGF members are there. When I was at BGF a couple of years ago, they had this incredibly amazing schedule. I shouldn't even say it because other people might do a similar kind of thing, but four talks a day over nine days. And still, we had done all the success when we were finished. And that's how usually it goes. You know? it is a, there's a lot of things to be covered there. So uh, uh, we do things gradually, you know, uh, sometimes we do something, other times we do other things. Uh, but anyway, it's just exciting how much uh, interesting thing the suit does, uh, and we can bring these things out over time. Uh, but then there is this other little sentence here, which is very interesting. Yeah, after they have recollected the qualities of the Buddha, uh, they say it is good to see such perfected ones. Uh, yeah, and uh, there's something very beautiful about that uh, the perfect ones here are the arahants uh, yeah and the people of india they're saying it is good to see such arahants uh, and there's something um, amazing how do they even think like this how, how often do you go around singapore yeah or kl and people say, yeah it's good to see those arahants yeah we should go and see those arahants uh, how often does it happen here in australia if i go down the local a village in you know, Serpentine or go into Perth, how many people say, yeah, we should go and see the perfected? Nobody says that, yeah? It just doesn't happen. But in the, our modern world, sometimes we are so rich in material things, but we have such poverty in, spirit, in our spiritual life. Our inner life is so often. That is precisely because we focus too much on the material things of the world. And this is very, very problematic. And here you can see in an Indian society, it was very different. Uh, the Buddha would just arrive in some kind of random village. And in this random village, straight away, everyone would say, yeah, we should go and see these arahants, these perfected teachers. There was this natural inclination towards spirituality, a natural inclination to understanding the value of developing your mind, developing your inner qualities, and doing something with your life that has more profound meaning and purpose rather than all the superficial things that we tend to fill our lives with in our modern societies. So wouldn't it be wonderful if here in Australia, if in Singapore, if in KL, people would say to each other, wow, you know, I heard there's an, an arahant has arrived, yeah? or maybe, uh, you know, maybe a, a stream mentor, or it doesn't matter what they are, yeah, some, some amazing teacher, maybe we should all go and see them, and then everybody, the whole of KL, okay, maybe not the whole of KL, there's too many people, yeah, uh, the, the whole of the neighborhood, wherever it is, yeah, in Singapore, everyone in the flatter blocks goes together, and you listen to the teaching because everyone is so keen on understanding more about the spiritual life, about those things that really matter in the world. And to me, this is one of those beautiful things about the Indian society. Indian society is one of those rare societies where spirituality is often very much in focus. Everyone is spiritual in a certain way. 
Of course, sometimes that spirituality is misguided. It may not have the right, wrong view and all of that, but there is at least an inclination and an interest towards these things. And I think this is something that the rest of the world could very easily learn from India about the value of the inner life and the importance of these things. Yeah, This was how they were looking at things. So it is a fascinating, interesting little thing there, just right there at the very beginning of this uh, uh, sutta. So uh, that's what they say. And then what happens is that the Kalamas, they went to the Buddha. And then before sitting down to one side, some of them bowed. Some exchanged greetings and polite conversation. Some held up their joined palms towards the Buddha. Some announced their name and clan, while some kept silent. Yeah? So what is this all about? Why, how come they behave so differently? These days, if you go to the temple, everyone bows down. But here, it seems like a bit more random. You do all kind of stuff. And what is nice about this is a reminder to us that we don't, you know, if we are not convinced of Buddhist yet, if we are on the way to becoming Buddhist, or we are inclining in that way, we don't have to force people to do all the Buddhist rituals. First time you come to a monastery, or you come to a temple, you can be, please don't close the door, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please don't close the door today. Yeah, it gets too, it gets too cold in there. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. So I was just saying that uh, uh, the idea behind this is that uh, uh, we don't have to have a particular way of doing things. Yeah, we, the way we do things depends on our commitment to the Dhamma depends on our commitment to the Buddhist teachings. And it's okay if you wish to, uh, if you wish to do things in a way, especially in the beginning, that is different. That is perfectly okay and perfectly acceptable. We don't have to be so kind of unified in these things. That is a, it's a relaxing way of thinking about these Buddhist teachings and how we deal with these things. Uh, initially, we can be a bit more at ease and not have to force people to bow down and all of these kind of things. So um, um, let us uh, go on. So when, when everyone was seated to one side, uh, uh, they said, uh, the Kalamas said to the Buddha, and this is what they say to him. There are, sir, some ascetics and Brahmins who come to Kesamutta. They explain and promote only the outdoor in her, while they attack, badmouth, disparage, and smear the doctors of others. Then some other ascetics and Brahmins come to Kesamutta, and they too explain, promote only their own doctrine, while they attack, badmouth, disparage, and smear the doctrines of others. So, sir, we are doubting and uncertain. We wonder who of these respected, respected ascetics and Brahmins speak the truth and who speak falsehood. So um, uh, here we have a classical situation that almost everyone comes into at some time. Is the idea that we hear many different teachings that, and often these teachings will often be very uh, contradictory, uh, and often they will be mu mutually contradictory. One person will say uh, A, another person will say the exact opposite, uh, and these things clashing with each other. Uh, yeah, and this is a very kind of common problem in the world. Uh, and uh, so it is a very interesting. How do we deal with that kind of situation? Uh, yeah, maybe when you start out uh, in your life, maybe uh, you find that you're looking at maybe different religions, uh, and it's not. About and they compare a little bit uh, to see what uh, you know. What do they, they teach in Christianity? Uh, what do they teach in Hinduism? Uh, how does it compare to, with the Buddhist teachings uh, and all of these kind of things? Uh, and uh, then you start to get a 
basis for comparing these things uh, and you can actually do something about it uh, yeah so this is uh, uh, the way so this is actually a very important part of these uh, these teachings uh, so um yeah So the question then is, what, what do we do when we have this kind of contradiction in things? How do we make the choices? How do we choose teachers? And how do we choose a religion in this world? And this is also true for within Buddhism itself. Yeah, how do we decide what kind of Buddhism or what kind of teachers to choose within Buddhism? Because obviously these things vary. There is a lot of variability and a lot of self-contradicting things happening also within the Buddhist teachings. And for that reason, it becomes very interesting here. So what does the Buddha say Yeah, when you have all of these doubts and uncertainty and perplexity about things? And this is what the Buddha says. He says it is enough kalamas for you to be doubting and uncertain. Doubt has come up in you about an uncertain matter. And uh, so this is uh, the very first thing the Buddha says before even coming to the question of who is right and who is wrong, uh, how to decide what is right and wrong in this world. Uh, the very first thing he says is that it's okay to have doubt. And uh, this, again, is one of those things that I think is very special to the Buddhist teachings, uh, that having doubt is actually okay. Uh, in many of the teachings around the world, in many religions, uh, doubt is not really acceptable, but in Buddhism, actually, it is uh, fine. Uh, and I think this is very important, yeah, because it allows us to read the teachings or to listen to talks uh, and actually think about them uh, and then make up our mind gradually when we feel that we are ready to hear these teachings, uh, instead of feeling a kind of a, a, a pull or a force that we have to believe in something when we are not ready. Uh. And there's something very beautiful that comes out of that, many, many beautiful things that come out of that. Uh, first of all, we don't have to be brutal against our own nature. Uh. Our own nature is very often to have doubt about things, yeah? It is impossible not to have doubt about things ever. So we don't have to be brutal with ourselves. And um, which is, I think, is very nice. It is very, um, uh, it is kind of psychologically nice. We shouldn't really repress our feelings or repress things in this way. It actually leads to even more problems. And then gradually we can come to an understanding and see if these things are acceptable to us. So this is the first thing. Personally, it is nice to be able to have doubt, yeah? And then gradually allow these teachings to come in. But it is also good for harmony in our society. Uh, yeah? if, uh, if you are not allowed to have doubt, it means that very often we will argue much more. If someone challenges you about the Buddhist teaching and says that there is no such thing as rebirth uh, and you are not allowed to have any doubt, or whatever, it creates a lot of disharmony because you become very dogmatic. We say this is the thing things are. It, it cannot be any other way. Uh, but if someone challenges you about the idea of rebirth uh, and they say to you that, you know, oh, I don't really believe in rebirth, uh, you can shrug your shoulder. You can say, well, actually, I don't really know either. I, I too am uncertain about rebirth. Uh, I think that there is a rebirth, uh, but I can't really know because the only way you can know these things is through a deep kind of insight or maybe a recollection of past lives or something like that. Uh, but not, uh, we don't know this straight away. Uh, so it actually, you know, you are allowed to shrug your sh shoulders more. You don't have to be so defensive. Uh, you don't have to argue with others uh, because you actually realize that a lot of these things we don't really know. There are some things that you may know, but a lot of these things you don't, and you are in the process uh, of moving towards that understanding here. Uh. So the idea of it being okay to have doubt actually is very, very helpful, both on the personal level, but also on the social level. And it is one of those many areas where Buddhism is radically different from almost all other philosophies and, and religions and spiritual teachings in the world. It's a different approach to the idea of the spiritual life. And this is what is so beautiful about it. So this is the first thing the Buddha says. And once he has uh, talked about, said this, then he talks about what 
well, how to deal with the situation when we have conflicting teachings, conflicting ways of looking at the world. How do we deal with that in such a way as we can actually make some kind of progress and we can actually learn something and, and uh, gain something from that, yeah? And this is what he says, how we make decisions about this. He says, please, Kalama, sir, don't go by oral transmission. Don't go by lineage. Don't go by testament. Testament is like the report of others, yeah, what other people say. Don't go by canonical authority. Yeah? Don't rely on logic. Don't rely on inference. Don't go by reason contemplation. Don't go by the acceptance of a view after consideration. Don't go by the appearance of competence. And don't think the ascetic is our respected teacher. But when you know for yourself these things are unskillful, these things are blameworthy, criticized by sensible people, and when you undertake them, they lead to harm and suffering, then you should give them up. So this is how the Buddha says that you should approach something when you have different teachings. Yeah? What is the way to deal with that? And you will notice there that there is two, three main criteria that the Buddha is talking about. Yeah? Three main ways of looking at things. And the first way is the idea that we have is scriptures in the, in the world. Yeah? from different religions. And this is the ideas here of uh, uh, transmission and lineage and testament and canonical authority. The vast number, most vast majority of religions, they have this kind of situation where you have a certain scriptures uh, and people will say, go to those scriptures. Uh, that is where the truth is found, yeah? And that is where the Christians will say by going to the Bible. That is what the Muslims will say, go to the Quran. And that is what the Buddhist will say too, go to the Majjhima Nikaya, yeah? go to the middle length sayings, read that, and it gives you the truth. So maybe we are exactly the same as the Christians. Yeah? Go there, read this, and then the truth will be yours. So but the Buddha says, Italy, put those things away. Yeah? Leave those things aside. How do we know that these things are true? And at the beginning, you cannot really know. If you take the Majjhima Nikaya, and you just and you take everything on board as the absolute truth, well, then you are the same as all these other people, yeah, the same as uh, the Christians who just take these things on board, and you're not really thinking properly for yourself. You need to start with a, uh, an earlier point. You need to think about things in a more basic way before you can take on board things like the Buddhist teachings. And that is what the Buddha is talking about here. So don't start with these uh, uh, authorities that we have in this world. Uh, it is very fascinating because it says something also to us as Buddhists, uh, how we should deal with the Buddhist teachings that we have, especially in the beginning, yeah, when we start out. Uh, later on down the track, when we are more committed to this path and we know what we are talking about, uh, we know what these teachings are, then of course you can, will start to read the suttas, you will engage with them in a different way. But as you start out, uh, this sort of problem will, uh, this is the right way of approaching things. Then gradually you move towards uh, uh, using the suttas in a different way. Huh? So this is uh, very important and very interesting for us as Buddhists and for anyone else. Huh? But the second thing here, which is equally interesting and equally important, uh, and this is so important because this is the sort of thing that we also pride ourselves on in the modern world. And the Buddha is saying that even logic, you should be careful with using logic. Yeah, he says it quite literally, don't rely on uh, contem reason, contemplation, and acceptance of a view often after consideration and inference and all of these. And all of these things are different ways of using logic. And uh, again, this is very interesting because, of course, Logic is something that we have to rely on in our lives to some extent. We use logic all the time, yeah? To be able to do anything in this life, it matters so enormously. So how can the Buddha say we should put aside logic? What does he mean by this? It sounds scary. If you, if you can't use logic, how are you going to get anything done? Everything is based on logic to some extent. 
And uh, the answer is that uh, we need to understand the limits of logic. Yeah? And uh, the limits of logic are that uh, uh, we, when you have a logical system, yeah, a logical system can be like mathematics or it can be physics or whatever. They are built up through theorems and axioms and all of these things. Uh, when you have a logical system, uh, it is always based on something. Yeah? There is a foundation. Uh, there are axioms. There are root things that we have to agree on at the very beginning, without which there is no a logical system at all. So if those root things, if those axioms that we start out with at the very beginning, if they are false, yeah, if they are wrong, then the whole logical system itself also becomes problematic. The whole logical system actually falls and stands on whether our axioms are correct or not. And this is one of those very important things you will, you know, I don't know if you have any familiarity with logic and mathematics and these things, uh, but it is often debated among philosophers whether the logical axioms of philosophy or mathematics are correct, uh, because they point out we could have a different axioms and then we would have a different kind of mathematics. And this is very important in Buddhism. And it's very important in the spiritual life, uh, because according to Buddhism, uh, some of the basic assumptions that we make in our spiritual life, that we make in our life in general, from a Buddhist point of view, they are wrong. And because our most basic ideas of reality, of ourselves, our existence are wrong, it means that our entire understanding of our life, of our spirituality, of meditation practice, the uh, philosophies that we have of the world, whether we think about eternalism or annihilationism or whatever, because the basic foundation of things is wrong, it means that all of these other things also fall apart and they turn out to be wrong. Uh, our views about reality are wrong because we have a misunderstanding at the very root of those views. Uh, but yeah, what, what is that misunderstanding? And that misunderstanding goes to the very core of what Buddhist teaching is about. Yeah. That understanding is seeing a self where there is no self. It is seeing an inherent essence in the human being where actually there is none. And because we build our worldview, we build our philosophies, we build our religious convictions, we build the idea of eternal of life carrying on after we die. We build the idea of annihilation, annihilationism, yeah? Everything comes to an end when you die. These things are built on that assumption. It means that so much the philosophy of religion in the world is false because it is built on false assumptions. So this is the inherent problem with logic, yeah? Logic only works if our assumptions are right. Are right. If our assumptions are wrong, the whole system starts to fall apart and it becomes very difficult and very problematic. So what is our alternative? And this is the, uh, now we come to the really interesting part. Yeah? If we cannot rely on logic, not all the time anyway, on the occasion or only you know, part of the time, if we cannot rely on the teachings from the past or the scriptures that have been handed down, what can we rely on? This is where the Buddha says that what we should rely on more than anything else, according to Buddhism, is our experience of the world. Yeah? What, how do we understand the world? How do we experience the world? And once you base your, uh, your acceptance of a teaching on that, you check with your experience. And if a teaching matches with your experience, yeah, whether it is Buddhism or whatever it is, then if it matches experience, then you have a basis or a foundation for uh, relying on that particular teaching. Uh, so experience is primary. Uh, and this is something that you find throughout the Buddhist teachings. Yeah? Everything in Buddhism really ultimately comes down to experience. Uh, experiencing, understanding why morality works, uh, experiencing, trying to understand uh, why meditation works, why insight or wisdom works, uh, and all of these kind of things. Uh, yeah? Ultimately, all of these things come down to experiencing reality, understanding how things are based on what real 
on what, what life actually feels like to us. Uh, that is the kind of bottom line. Uh, but um, of course, it is not just experience. Yeah, it is more complicated than that. Experience is the beginning, uh, and then. And as you start experiencing things, as you start to see things in the right way, then of course, then the idea of scriptures start to matter again. If you start to see that the Buddha's teachings make sense, then you can go back to those Buddhist teachings. You start to use them again. And when you start to use them, it enriches your own experience because then you measure up those teachings with your own experience and then they build together. And when they build together in this way, that is when you have the right attitude to these teachings. And then you start to accept things like teachings of rebirth and all of that. Know oh, that the general teachings agree with how you, how you what, what your experience is like. And that is the, the nice thing about this. And then you also start to use logic, yeah, because you start to understand the uh, limits of logic. And you start to, you have now, you have a way of using logic in a good way. And uh, because of that, uh, it enables you to use logic also in a positive way in your life because you have taken away some of those uh, problems at the root, some of the axioms, some of the wrong things that we, where we think about life in the wrong way. And it allows you now to think about life in a more constructive fashion. And this is the nice things about this. Uh, so uh, that is what the Buddha says. And that's why he says that when you know for yourself, yeah, that uh, these things, that when you undertake them, they lead to harm and suffering. Uh, yeah. When, uh, in other words, when you see that something is a problem, that is when you uh, actually give them up. Uh, and that is then what the rest of the sutta is about. It is how we then uh, think about life in such a way that we uh, look at our experience and how that then leads us to guide ourselves in the right direction so that we can uh, give up yeah, our bad and we can carry out and we can do things uh, when things actually happen to be heading in the right direction. Uh, but I think maybe that is enough for now because uh, uh, we have been going on for an hour already. And uh, so I think the idea of the program is to do a little bit of uh, the suttas and then also come back, uh, do some meditation together. So maybe now is a good time to do some meditation for the uh, second part of this session. So uh, please hang in there for the suttas uh, and uh, we will uh, go through this in much more detail down the track, uh, but at least that is the uh, foundation. And then we're gonna carry on looking at how this leads naturally to the idea of virtue and morality and all of these kind of things. Uh, as a consequence of what we have seen there. Okay, so uh, I guess we can just go seamlessly onto the meditation. So let's just carry, uh, let's get into that now. Okay, everyone. So just um, as always, just start down the same way uh, and uh, close your eyes and start off by just uh, uh, 
relaxing and find ease of the body and the ease of the mind. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, start out very gently. Uh, and especially when you go on a six day meditation retreat, uh, it is always useful to just be very gentle with yourself and have a sense of care for yourself. Uh, where you allow yourself to relax and you allow yourself at ease. Uh, so just relax for a while uh, and then we'll gradually take it towards the meditation here. Uh.
And uh, make sure that you take a lot of, uh, especially as you start out, uh, just by relaxing and just allowing things to go. Uh, this kind of allowing things to be in the background. Uh, one, of ways, one of the ways I like to think about meditation practice at this point uh, is not to think of it as meditation. Uh, because the moment you think the word meditation, uh, it starts to give you an idea that you have to do something. You have to do the meditation practice. Uh, to learn to really relax, uh, try to relax in a different way. Uh, imagine yourself instead of meditating. Uh, imagine yourself like coming home after a long day's work uh, and you are really tired uh, and you sit down. And when you sit down and you relax after a long day's work, uh, you don't do anything. Uh, you just relax. You don't think about anything in particular. Uh, you just allow your mind to run. Uh, you allow your mind to do what it wants to do. Uh, in the same way, meditation should be just allowing yourself to be, uh, allowing your mind to run. Uh, and your job is just to relax, just as uh, if you are sitting in an armchair and just doing absolutely nothing here.
and uh, to be able to allow the process of relaxation to proceed in a smooth way. Uh, please make sure you don't go to the breath too early. Uh, just allow the breath to be in the background. Uh, and just allow the body to relax. Uh, the breath can be there, but it should not be the main object of focus when you start out. Uh, just enjoy the peace or enjoy what is going on uh, and just allow the mind to run her. Uh, and just very gently incline the mind to peace. And the way to do that is just to remember where true happiness and true purpose and true meaning is to be found in the world. And when you remember that much, when you have that degree of right view, if you like, then your mind will naturally incline towards the peace. And gradually you will actually become more peaceful as a consequence.
And as you meditate in this way, uh, just try to notice the delight, the very simple situation of meditation practice. Uh, when you have let go of so many of the things in your life, uh, you put aside your family and your work and all of these other responsibilities. Uh, and all that you have left is just you and your breath and the peace and quiet around you. What a wonderful thing it is to put down all of those things in the world uh, and just move toward the peace inside her. Uh, the more you can understand the delight and the ease of letting go of the thing in the world, uh, and the more you can focus on the beauty of the peace of meditation practice, uh, the easier the path becomes. Uh, because you are focusing, you are inclining the mind uh, in the right direction. Uh.
Okay, everyone, so we're coming close to the end of the meditation. And, and before we come to the very end, uh, just spend a few moments, a minute or two, just reflecting on the progress or lack of progress you have made. Uh, and if you do feel a bit more peaceful, a bit more relaxed, uh, a bit more at ease, uh, then ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, what are the perceptions that you have developed? Uh, how have you inclined the mind to make the meditation work? Yeah. Okay, yeah, everyone, uh, that's it for this afternoon. Uh, so I wish you all well. I hope you have a nice retreat, a nice evening with Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and we will see you back again uh, tomorrow at the same time. Uh, so take care, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you very much.